G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel as we approach this season's preseason games. I'm very excited to see all the teams in action. I feel like I've done a lot of talking about football over the last three months and uh, not a lot of watching football, in fact zero. So I'm looking forward to it and with that, it means that it's time for evaluating what we think each club should rightfully expect as a pass mark for season 2024. Now to be clear, what I'm trying to capture in this video is what each club internally would be happy with as an outcome from this particular season. Now, bear in mind, these are not predictions. So as I go through each of the 18 teams, bear in mind, I'm not saying that even half of these teams are going to hit these expectations. I'm just trying to get a bit of a feel for what I think they'll be expecting from this season. Now for sure, these things are nuanced and not every club will necessarily have an objective uh, criteria of you know how many wins we get in season 2024, how deep we go into finals. Some teams probably will have objective measures like that and some won't. So for the most part, I have come up with some objective criteria, but we'll discuss that some teams, particularly at the lower end of the ladder, will be looking for different things out of this coming season. Before I crack into the video, if you could do me a favor, if you're looking for a channel making plenty of AFL content, you're looking at one, and it would mean a lot to me if you help me grow this channel by hitting the subscribe button and even liking the video if you enjoy it. So I'm gonna move through the ladder of last year in reverse order, which means we'll start with the Wooden Spooners. Who is that again? Uh, yeah, that's right, the West Coast Eagles, how could I forget? So what can West Coast meaningfully expect from season 2024. It's a little bit harder to ascertain exactly what. They're kind of in the position where, you know, if they win a wooden spoon, I don't think anyone's getting sacked. It's kind of the nature of how that season unfolds. For instance, if West Coast have a season similar to last year, you'd imagine absolutely people are getting sacked for that. Uh, that being said, if they improve their percentage by 20% and get an extra win, um, and you know, have, eliminate a lot of those horrific losses that we saw last year, that might be enough to say, hey, we took some strides this year, even though we didn't move up the ladder. That being said for West Coast, I think if you factor in you know, a lot of players coming back into the side, with that, there needs to be an increase of expectation. If the Eagles suddenly get you know, Elliot Yo fit for 20 games, McGovern for 20 games, which seems like an absolute long shot. If that sort of stuff happens, then we can't really hold the team to the same standard as it was last year. So I'm gonna say that six wins is a nice goal for West Coast. If they achieve six wins in 2024, that is very satisfactory improvement. Now let's talk about North Melbourne. Alistair Clarkson's first full year, you'd hope, at the North Melbourne Footy Club. And uh, was it four bottom two finishes in a row? I think North are probably at the point where they, they can set an objective criteria of saying, hey, let's try and get six wins this season, because that will be a big tangible improvement on previous years and they did improve in 2023. I think they had an extra win and significantly better percentage, but I think they can extrapolate that further and say probably about six wins as well. Now, while I say that, I do acknowledge that North Melbourne just did shed a lot of experience and, and they might argue we didn't rely on that experience of Zeebel and Cunnington as much. That being said, they did cut hard and subsequently they are now the least experienced and the youngest side in the competition. And with that, I think we do need to temper expectations a little. Hence why I'm sitting on six wins. If they achieve that, I think you can say fair play North. Hawthorne finished third last and they had six or seven wins off the top of my head. Um, and you know, some really good compelling performances in that. I've used these examples before, but I think if you knock off the team that eventually won the premiership and you are sitting on the bottom of the ladder at one point and take on one of the other teams around your level at the time in West Coast and beat them by 20 goals, it really showed the clear gap that Hawthorne had on the other teams that competed for the wooden spoon, even though they did finish third last. To some extent, I think Hawthorne are a little bit free of genuine expectation this year. Sure, I'd say you know a, a nice objective criteria would be to improve by at least one win, and I think that's eight wins for Hawthorne this year but they're probably still in that phase of their rebuild where they're just looking for improvement, some consistency from some of the young guys. They want to see their forward line firing. So there's some subjective and arbitrary measures that they might have in place, but I'm sure that they would prefer to improve by one win than necessarily regress. So I'd say they want to at least improve, but I don't think there's a huge impetus on them necessarily making the top 10 and pushing for finals yet. Of course, they're going to strive for that, but I'm just saying if they only have the eight wins, there's still a very good likelihood that they think, oh, well, we took some strides this year. That's okay. Let's talk about the Gold Coast Suns. And this is where I would differ with this analysis because I think with their where their list is at and a lot of the young players that have been on the list for a while now starting to take some strides, new coach Damien Hardwick. I would suggest that, yes, on the one hand, part of what they'll be doing is just trying to get used to a new game style. And I don't know how dramatically that is going to change. I'd imagine Hardwick does curate a game style based on the talent he's got, not on the talent that he had at Richmond. So that could be a smooth transition. I'd imagine there'll be a few teething issues. That being said, I think they're absolutely at the point where they need to be trying to achieve their best ever season. And for them, that's just simply finishing higher than 12th. 
I think that would be a great season. And if they finish 11th, I'd say satisfactory improvement. And they'll next year go make the finals. Let's talk about Fremantle, a team that has consistently gotten younger over the last few years and had really inconsistent performances. We've seen, obviously, their performances in some games were left a lot to be desired. And then on the other hand, you know, they won at GMHBA, they beat the Ds, they beat the Swans in Sydney. We're seeing a real dichotomy between the best and worst at Fremantle. And while they've gotten younger and lost a couple of best 22 players, I think a minimum expectation for them is to improve on last year. So again, I don't think necessarily considering how young they still are, their list has bled a bit of experience over the last few years. If you can bear that in mind, I don't think it's necessarily key that they push back into the finals. But they do need to get closer than they did last year because sometimes they were very lackluster. And if they can smooth out those performances, I'd say that's a year of progress. And similar to Gold Coast, it's probably the year after that where you start lifting those expectations. Then we've got the Richmond Footy Club. And this is the single hardest one to try and find some objective criteria for Adam Uze because I think to some extent he will be a little bit free of expectation. We do have a Richmond supporter base that is a little bit, well, they've become accustomed to a degree of success. So they'll be hoping to play finals, absolutely. But I don't think it's necessarily key if they don't make the finals this year but they take strides in terms of the way they play their football uh, particularly getting some games into some youth you know Tom Brown Sam Banks Samson Ryan Trezise is another one that comes to mind do we see a bit of steely green I think rotating those guys through the side getting a little bit of exposure ha having them play a fairly cohesive and consistent game style I think that's really what Richmond's ultimately going to strive for this year. So I think if they simply avoid the bottom four, I think that's not a failure. And that's not to say that i placing a massive cap on them and that they can't play finals. I just think it's so much gray area with Richmond in evaluating Uze's first season that I think avoiding the bottom four is pretty much the minimum expectation. Now we've got Geelong, another tricky one to try and assess because you know there's a school of thought that they have dipped out of finals and will stay that way for a number of years to come. And there's another school of thought, particularly Geelong fans that think last year was a blip on the radar and then expect to jump back into finals. And I would suggest that if I had to guess what the internal expectation was, I would say it's to return to finals. Geelong is not really an organization that, in my mind, would accept that this is the start of the rebuild. I think they're going to try and push a bit competitive and kind of rely on their ability to attract players to their club rather than you know necessarily accept that it's time for draft picks. And when you look at the talent of that list, strong back line, strong forward line, but the midfield for me is probably what sets them apart from other genuine top four shouts. So I think Geelong is a good finals chance this year. I'm not going to say they should have any higher expectations than finishing in the top eight, uh, but I'd imagine what's it, that's what their goal is for sure. For Essendon, another tricky one. Um, you know, we saw some good signs last year and they uh, missed out on finals ultimately. I think they finished 11th in the end. I would just suggest some linear improvement. The reason being, okay, so on the one hand, they just recruited four players uh, best 22 players, established players, and that comes with some expectation. You don't do that unless you're ultimately striving to push up the ladder relatively quickly. They're trying to plug some gaps, and they did a, that a really good offseason. I think when you factor in, they kept their first rounder and took Nate Caddy. Really good offseason from Essendon. That being said, like I've said in other videos, my concern with Essendon is not so much just the list talent, but it's like their capacity to just roll over a little bit. And I say that with all due respect, but... You know, you point to their last seven games last year. So I think I think if they finish in the top 10 and ultimately don't have those games where the supporters are left scratching their heads and going, why does this keep happening? I think that would be a successful year for Essendon. I don't know if they need to make the finals. I think top 10 would be some linear improvement. And then again, following year, expectations rise. Then we've got Adelaide who finished 10th in last year's ladder and, you know, obviously missed out controversially and therefore I think setting a minimum expectation of playing finals is probably about right. I think they're ready. I think their best 22 has come a long way. The unearthing of Jordan Dawson as a gun on ball midfielder has really boosted their prospects I think. In particular I would have thought you know young midfield talent wasn't quite there yet or at least in a proven sense. We look at a lot of players that could transition into full-time midfielders that aren't yet but Jordan Dawson being an A grader when you also combine that with an extremely good forward line I think the talent is there. Their ability to win games at home consistently and also win big at home is really impressive. Backline is probably going to be a little bit of a work in progress but nonetheless I think the tools are there to play finals and I I'd imagine if they miss finals again, they'll think, oh, that was a bit of a missed year. Then we got the Western Bulldogs. And again, this one is tricky because we saw them miss finals last year and I would imagine they've probably felt that they've been underachieving. And you just have to listen to the supporter base talk about beverage to understand that Doggies fans think that they're playing below what their best 22 is capable of. And I would agree with that. So I would say bouncing back into finals is probably enough for them to say, okay, good start. 
That being said, it's a little bit tricky with them because some of their guns are aging. Like Tom Liberatore is very close to the end, I would imagine. Maybe he's got a few years left, but he's no spring chicken, as it were. Bond is in his prime now. So is a seventh or eighth finish going to be really satisfactory to Bulldogs fans? I'm not too sure. The reason I've probably only put it as finals is probably, you know, look at last year and they finished the season poorly. I think if they can improve on that and get that consistency back, but only finish seventh or eighth, that might be acceptable. You also factor in Bailey Smith's done an ACL. I find it hard to gauge, and I'd be interested to see what Bulldogs fans are realistically expecting. Is it higher? Is it top six? Or are some people thinking, no, I'm not happy with Beveridge until we make the top four? I can see arguments for all of that, considering how I rate their talent. Powerful forward line, really good midfield, even without Bailey Smith. I think they'll go all right. Tough one. I, I'm going to say finals conservatively, but you could justifiably have it higher than that. The Sydney Swans is another tough one. They made the finals last year after a dogged season with injury. They really struggled with their back line in particular and still did a great job to make the finals in the end. And I think that speaks to the culture that's there. I don't think they look fully fit last year um, at certain points. I'd say if they can just improve to get back into the top six, I do still have a little bit of a concern over their back six. I talked about that, particularly the key back stocks, but it doesn't mean that they can't be a genuine contender. But I think if you also factor in how young this team is, like there's a lot of players still there that are well and truly off their prime. Like Chad Warner's a young guy, Amati, Logan McDonald. I forget how old Tom McCartan is, but I feel like he's still a way off being in his prime as a key position player. Errol Goulden's still young too. So I think you can temper expectations and say, all right, if we, if we incrementally just sort of move up the ladder for the next couple, we can have a real swing in a couple of years. I wouldn't put a cap on Sydney finishing top two. Like, I don't think that's absolutely crazy, uh, but I think I'll conservatively say top six would probably be a fair pass mark. We've got GWS now. Um, this one is tricky because they started the year so poorly last year, really clicked into the gear, made it all the way to a prelim, and conceivably, like, were very... They, they could have won the flag. Like, it was completely conceivable that from, you know, three-quarter time in the prelim, that the Giants could have gone all the way. So I think we have to have relatively high expectations for the Giants. They've got a lot of young budding guns, but I do think they do kind of rely a lot on their best players who are now probably ticking close to 30 or just above it. Toby Green, Stephen Cornelio, Whitfield. And so by extension, there, there should be some expectation. And I think... Finishing in the top four is probably got to be what they're striving for. I would argue the way they finished last year and the maturity of their list in pockets, in some places they're kind of inexperienced, but particularly their midfield, I think where the list is at is kind of precariously poised where the, the impetus to win games is now. And I think if they finish fifth or sixth after last year, I think they'd be a little bit flat with that when you factor in the top four is probably what it takes to really contend most years. We do kind of know that they're the sort of team who, if they just simply make finals, they generally win one or two minimum. But still, I, I would say top four or at least a prelim is probably you know the, the minimum expectation there. Let's talk about St Kilda. Uh, this one is also tricky because they made the finals last year, but because I thought from a quality of football point of view, I thought they dipped hard last year. And, and you look at the year before that and their performance has really dropped off. They've kind of got a mix of some really good players in their prime and some really budding young that are still ways off actually hitting that prime. Your Wanganine Millers, your Philippus, your Machito Owens. I would probably simply say that they should strive to make finals again in their second year under Ross Lyon. And again, it's probably just about evening out those performances, playing that game style for 24 rounds a season. And if they do that, you know, I think they're a top four chance. When you factor in as well how injury hit, particularly in the first half of last year, St Kilda's forward line was. From memory, they were statistically quite poor in forward 50 inefficiency. But Max King gets a good run at it, good preseason, doesn't miss much football. You know, Higgins and Butler are very good smalls. But that being said, I would think, you know, if they finish sixth or seventh again, that's okay. And again, the year after that, that's where they raise their expectations. Saints fans, let me know what you think. Then we got Carlton who finished fifth. Again, tough, tough, because another team that finished the season so well and in my opinion, has the talent poised to really have sustained success. The only thing with Carlton is though that they still didn't make the top four last year. And because it was their first dip into finals in such a long time, do we slacken the expectations or do they drop their expectations slightly on next year? Knowing that, in my opinion anyway, with the list profile, they've still got plenty of years of a potential window. As opposed to GWS, I don't think there's the same implied pressure on Carlton to strike now. Uh, so comparatively, I would probably say top six is a passable year. If they get a home final, I think they can sit back and go, okay, we didn't go forward, but we kind of consolidated. We made finals again. We got more finals experience. I think that's probably a fair expectation for Carlton. Again, not putting a cap on what they can achieve, but if we're just talking like what would be a season where they could sit back and go, 
that's fine. I'd say probably top six for them. Now we're into our top four teams. Let's talk about Melbourne. Uh, a couple of years of straight sets in a row. Mature list, somewhat aging. And what I mean by that is they, they probably can't have too many misfires anymore. You know what I mean? With the list profile that they're at, they're not like about to dip off the edge like you know people thought Geelong were. Uh, but that being said, contrasting it to some of the younger teams in the eight, I think Melbourne probably do have an expectation that they can't repeat last year as such. I think top four is a minimum expectation. I think if they finish fifth, that's a misfire considering their list profile. This group has already won a premiership. They performed fairly poorly in finals over the last few years. It's a little bit tougher to, to forecast an expectation for them, but I'd say top four and prelim and we'll win a final. Top four on its own is not enough because if they go straight sets hypothetically three years in a row, they're not gonna sit back on that and going, yeah, that was okay. But winning a final, getting to a prelim and just missing out might just be a little bit better. So I'd say that's probably the expectation. Melbourne is probably a prelim specifically. Let's talk about Port Adelaide who finished third and another team that went out in straight sets. So to contrast Melbourne and Port Adelaide, I think Port Adelaide still have a very good young list and therefore I forecasted like I did this video series in the off season AFL teams in three years and I looked at Port's team and I was like that team's not any weaker and you probably wouldn't be able to say the same thing about some of the other top four teams who are comparatively older particularly like the gun players at Port Adelaide are still quite young so what I mean by that is when we go back to this idea of pressure and needing to strike now sure Port Adelaide probably still need to make the top four and sure, if they don't win a final in the same way that Melbourne did, there will be absolutely some heat on that. So I'd say straight sets is probably probably another failure in, in a sense. Nobody wants to go out in straight sets. There's a lot of uh, shame associated with that. But I would contrast it to Melbourne and think, you know, if, if Port don't go deep this year, then I still think they're going to be okay next year. I still think they're going to be okay the year after that. So I would probably simply say theirs is top four. Now we're down to our final two teams, the Brisbane Lions. Uh, how, do we, how do we forecast their expectations? I think if you make a grand final and miss out, it's hard to have any other expectation than let's at least make the grand final again. So this one is almost like trying to get into the mind of the Brisbane Lions, um, which doesn't exist, they're an organization, but trying to get a feel for what they would perceive as, a, as an okay season. And I think it's gotta be make the grand final again. If they make the grand final again and they lose, then maybe there's still some sort of degree of closure. But I think you know losing a prelim, I think would be heartbreaking for them. I don't know if this point is making sense. Overall though, I think with the Lions like list profile, yes, they've got some really good young players, but they still do have a lot of players sort of somewhat getting on, somewhat getting on. Again, not about to tip off the edge, but there, there is a sense of we need to strike now with the Brisbane Lions. So I think I'm gonna have their pass mark as make the grand final again. And with Collingwood, by contrast, I think I'm gonna differentiate a little bit here and say probably top four. Now a factor in this is because they won a premiership already. And with that comes this sort of implied sense of like, if we don't go back to back, that's okay. Most teams don't. Because the year after that, they might come back. I, I, I think Brisbane will have a higher pass mark for season 2024 in terms of their own satisfaction than Collingwood. If Collingwood only make the top four, they can simply walk away from that and saying, okay, we didn't go back to back. Let's try again in 2025. With Brisbane, conversely, if they miss out on the grand final, I think they'll be more devastated. Let me know if any of that logic resonates with you, but that's what I'm trying to forecast here is their, their internal expectation for season 2024. Again, not a forecast of what I expect will happen, just more like trying to get in the heads of these clubs and try to predict what ultimately would satisfy them from an on-field point of view. But anyway, guys, that is my attempt at coming up with every team's pass mark in the league. Let me know in the comment section your thoughts. Did I get your team right? Was I too harsh? Was I too lenient? As always, I would do appreciate your input. I appreciate you being subscribed. I appreciate you watching most of all, and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.